People are consistently positive, while others wallow in negativity. Neuroscientist Richard J. Davidson has spent much of his career trying to answer these questions. He has discovered that we're all composed of six emotional styles. Emotional styles. He's been able to trace these styles to patterns of neural activity. That's the crucial link. A new book, The Emotional Life of Your Brain, considers how these patterns affect the way we live and other strategies to change them. Joining me now are the book's authors. Richard J. Davidson. He's a professor of psychology and psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Sharon Begley is a science editor at Reuters. I am pleased to have both of them at this table. This is a continuation of our series, which we call Brain Watch, uh, as we look often at the extraordinary developments in understanding the brain as the most exciting frontier of human insight. So welcome. Thank you so Having much. said that, welcome. Tell me about uh, what it is that you have discovered and this connection between emotional style and being able to see it uh, in terms of neural activity. Well, first, one of the most salient characteristics of emotion is that people respond to life's slings and arrows in different yeah. ways. Some people decompensate quickly in response to stress, and other people appear to be much more resilient. And from very early on in my career, those are the issues that really captured my attention and my interest. And uh, it was clear that in order to gain a better understanding of these emotional styles, we needed to look inside the brain because the brain is, after all, the organ of behavior. It is where uh, our emotions are ultimately generated. Uh, and so the search began with looking for patterns of activity that are associated with some of those variations among people in how they respond now, to This them. has been your lifeline, <clears throat> your, your professional life's primary preoccupation. It has. Why? Well, it always, it, it just struck me from early on that uh, how people respond to uh, these kinds of challenges was the key to understanding why different people are, are different in their unique personalities, mm -hmm. why some people may be vulnerable to certain psychiatric illnesses, and why people may even show a propensity for certain kinds of physical illnesses where stress seems to be an important ingredient in exacerbating. And what did your experience with the Dalai Lama teach you? My experience with the Dalai Lama taught me the, the central message is that emotional styles can change. Mm, so there's plasticity here. That's right. Okay. So uh, let's define the difference in emotional style and emotional traits and, and other things that are not emotional style, which is the subject of your focus. Well, uh, emo we, we define... Uh, what's a mood? What's a trait? What's style? Okay, so uh, there are uh, a set of terms. Uh, a mood can be uh, thought of as uh, a pattern of emotion that persists for uh, minutes or hours. Uh, a trait uh, is something that can persist for a very long, ta very long term, uh, but a trait uh, is different from an emotional style because the emotional styles that we describe come directly from neuro neuroscientific mm -hmm. research. Personality traits, which are commonly studied traits, predated our understanding of the brain. They are traits like introversion and extroversion, uh, those are, uh, or neuroticism, those are traits that emerged very early on in psychology's history before we really had a deeper understanding of the brain. The six styles that we describe come directly from neuroscientific research. I didn't decide one day that uh, I would think about uh, mm. the styles that characterize our emotional repertoire, but these really emerged over the course of 30 years of work. And where do you come into this, Sharon? Well, I've covered Richie's research for a number of years, and I did a book earlier on neuroplasticity, and the last chapter of that book was Richie. Um, that book documented the uh, very hard-won revolution in neuroscience, as you've mm -hmm. talked about with Eric Kandel, um, namely the discovery that, in fact, the brain structure and function is not set in stone from the ripe old age of three, but in fact can change radically depending on the, the life we lead. Depending on every experience you have. Exactly. You know. and, and just define for us neuroplasticity because it's a term that we the, the people like me throw around. Right. Um, it, it simply means the ability of the brain, especially the to adult brain, to change its structure and function in response to experience, mm -hmm. in response to the life you lead. Part of the, what you have discovered, part of the argument you make is in terms of an emotion can be located in a different part of the brain that we normally assume emotion comes from. 
Yeah, <clears throat> yes, that's very true. Uh, the prefrontal cortex <clears throat> is an area of the brain that is among the most recent to develop over the course of evolution. Uh, this is an area that many scientists consider to be very critical for the highest level right, of right. human thought. Right. Uh, and yet it also seems... Not emotion, to, but thought. But thought. But it also, based upon our work and now the work of many other scientists, uh, it seems to be intimately involved in emotion as well as thought. Mm -hmm. And it's a place where thought and emotion seem to come together. Uh, and so there are complicated decisions that we make in life, which are decisions that actually are benefited by emotion. Uh, decisions mm -hmm. such as whether we should marry a particular person or not, or uh, yeah. uh, those kinds of life decisions are not decisions that are made based upon a cold cognitive calculus. They are decisions that are made when we appeal to our emotions, and the prefrontal cortex plays a very important role in that. I now remember what the Dalai Lama said to you, I think. He basically said you focus on compassion. He, he did. Uh, he, when I first met him in 1992, he said, look, you guys have been using the tools of modern neuroscience to study fear, anxiety, sadness, yeah. depression. How about these positive qualities like exactly. compassion? And, and I didn't have a good answer other than that it was hard.